we're speaking about maverick scholars and people being looked upon as maverick, this is usually a, a term of um, negative uh, negativity to uh, try to ostracize them in, in some way. So there are a lot of um, people writing, um, I would call them aficionados who have taken up the cause and are publishing books on their own and through different means of uh, publishing at the moment. And this is uh, doing, uh, this is uh, making a fairly big impression on the internet. So it may turn out that what are called mavericks now in uh, generations to come, hopefully, um, can at least uh, be a counterweight to some of the scholarship. The scholarship, unfortunately, people in the field of of uh, studying these kind of documents, gospels and uh, other uh, materials of that kind, often come from seminaries or rabbinical institutions. And very often where the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were concerned, these were people who were under authority. So you really couldn't get uh, an objective view or to go beyond a certain point from them. They were they could go this far and no further, but they couldn't see, for instance, if you said the scrolls are really what Christianity was in Palestine, they couldn't go that far. I'm somewhat of a pessimist. I feel that the uh, authoritative documents are so authoritative in people's minds that even though new uh, points of view come into play, uh, it takes people maybe 30, 40 years of their life to develop these attitudes and uh, points of view, and it's very difficult to pass it on to a new, a new generation. So when young people or a new generation come up, they just start with the same documents that they had in the first place, and the same authoritative points of view hold, hold sway, and I'm not sure if in 2100 or 2200 we won't be looking at the same allegiances that we're seeing now. We're speaking about the Messianic movement in Palestine. I think that uh, I coined that phrase uh, maybe back in the mid-80s, 19, uh, the 1980s, uh, because when we were looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, people were using the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, to talk about Essenes. Uh, uh, occasionally they spoke about zealots. And this was uh, terminology that was uh, fairly normative and it meant certain things to people. But when you looked at the scrolls themselves, uh, they were more than that. And the um, idea of an Essene as described, for instance, in the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century or his earlier contemporary Philo of, of Alexandria also in the earlier first century, who spoke about Essenes. When you looked at these people, they were not talking about Essenes vis-a-vis -vis any um, Messiah situation. But if you look at the Qumran is the word we use to describe Dead Sea Scrolls, because it's an easier jargon, if you, it's where they were discovered. If you look at the Qumran documents, you'll see that they are full of uh, Messianic materials. Uh, they have all of the so-called messianic prophecies. Uh, they have even have uh, collections of messianic proof texts, uh, promises, for instance, to the seed of David, and uh, things like that. So things that we've uh, come laterally after Christi Christianity came into play in the Roman Empire and Christian documents took over the Western worldview, uh, prophecies that we became familiar with as sort of, sort of proof texts you find in these lists in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I began to call this the literature of the Messianic movement in Palestine. And that's why I use that phrase, not Essene, not Zealot, because um, uh, I don't think they called themselves Zealots. And um, we've never seen Essene used anywhere but Josephus and Philo. We, we don't even have it in the New Testament documents. So what were they calling themselves? And uh, there are many names, but I think the whole literature is the literature of, because of these messianic uh, quotes, the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine. The key prophecy 
uh, that we're talking about when we're speaking about the messianic movement in Palestine is usually the star prophecy. It's from Numbers, uh, I think it's uh, Numbers 24. Um, a star will rise from Jacob, a scepter to rule the world, etc., etc., etc. Often, for instance, in Christian uh, iconography, you see the star over Bethlehem. If you go to the catacombs in Rome, you'll see Balaam, who's the prophet in Numbers, who is supposed to have first uttered this prophecy, uh, pointing at the star uh, in, in the actual catacombs. So uh, the, the fundamental one was the star prophecy, because of this star will rise out of Jacob, a scepter to rule the world. Now this is in Josephus. Uh, Josephus says that this was capable of uh, the first century Jewish historian, of uh, multiple interpretations, and he, like rabbinic Judaism to follow him, uh, represents, let's say, the Pharisee approach. He uh, said, uh, he, did, he used the most cynical interpretation. He applied it to the rise of the Roman emperor in Palestine. Uh, the Roman emperor that destroyed the Jewish uh, uh, independent state in Palestine, that uh, uh, burned the temple and so on and so forth. He said he's the world ruler that would come out of Palestine. And therefore, he, he in return, got the moniker Flavius Josephus because the new emperors that came out of Palestine, the Roman generals, uh, Vespasian and Titus and so on, the Arch of Titus in Rome is still extant, uh, these people were called Flavians. So in return for his uh, cynical interpretation and sycophantism, he becomes Flavius Josephus. But Christianity, for instance, has this star prophecy as applying to their picture of Jesus. And in the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the star prophecy is uh, referred to in at least three extant documents. One we call the Damascus document, one we call the War Scroll, and in this list of Messianic proof texts that I said. That's quite incredible to have three. And Josephus at one moment in his uh, Jewish war book says that uh, the thing that most moved the Jews to re revolt against Rome was the prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. So, in other words, the war against Rome was a messianic war. So that's why I say that the scrolls are not only the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine, they're also the literature of the war against Rome. And you do have in this war scroll, a follow, it's in around, the scrolls are uh, divided into columns because they're read from right to left and so on in the normal Hebrew way because they're rolled on a scroll. So uh, around column 11 or so in the war scroll, you have this prophecy, and then they interpret it. And they interpret it in terms of the Messiah, and, the, and they also interpret it on, uh, in terms of the heavenly host coming on the clouds of heaven to rain judgment on all the world. Now, if you look in the New Testament, every time Jesus or John the Baptist or someone like that, in early church literature, James, the brother of, of uh, Jesus, is questioned, they speak about it, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, meaning with the heavenly host uh, for whatever they're supposed to do, rain judgment on, on the earth. And so I, I say that here's the war scroll giving its Palestinian version of these uh, ideas, and then in Christianity later, you have the reformulation as they're presented in the Gospels as we know them. Well, can this Messiah be called the Christ? Um, the Christ is a, a very uh, ephemeral Greek uh, terminology that very few people know what it actually meant. Um, Christos in Greek can mean compassion. Uh, in some versions, I suppose it can mean anointed one. I've never seen how that actually works out because this is a very precise Greek uh, transcription. But one thing is sure, the book of Acts, which describes the development of the church in its own somewhat tendentious manner, at least the first 15 chapters, speaks around uh, 10, 11 or so on, that Christians 
were first called Christians in Paul's church in Antioch in northern Syria somewhere. There's a lot of discussion on which Antioch that is. I don't think we need to get into that here. It's very technical, but uh, the head of the Seleucid Empire, which is where all these Antiochs were, there were at least four or five of them, uh, his father was, uh, was named An Antiochus or Antiochus. And so he named lots of cities after him. So the question is, which one are we talking about? Which Antioch is Paul's Antioch? Uh, but in any case, th that means in the mid-50s, when this is supposed to be happening in the book of Acts, Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. That means they weren't called Christians in Palestine. That means in the 30s, 40s, or whatever, or certainly probably up to, because it would take quite a long time for that terminology then to permeate back into Palestine, if that's an accurate presentation, that means they weren't called Christians in, in um, Palestine until quite late, I even probably until the war against Rome and thereafter. So what were they called? That's a Greek formulation. Uh, so I don't know if Christ is a, a, a perfect uh, translation of uh, Messiah or whether Christians were ever called Christians in Palestine until much later. So we have to ask, what were they called? And I think they were called, well, Messianists, perhaps, but uh, perhaps Ebionites. Ebion is the Hebrew word for poor, and the poor are mentioned in the War Scroll. The Dead Sea Scrolls call, talk about themselves in terms of the poor. Uh, the James community was called the Ebionites, the poor. The letter of James addresses the poor. And so that may have been one of the names. There's one early church historian. His name's called Hippolytus. There's a manuscript that was found attributed to him in Mount Athos in the 19th century that uh, was just recently found. We don't know if it was to him, but he has a, a version of the Jewish sects there, very much like Josephus, but slightly different than Josephus. And he speaks about there being four groups of Essenes, not one as in Josephus, but four. And two of these groups he calls Zealot Essenes and Sicari Essenes. Now, I think that's more like what the Dead Sea Scrolls were. That this, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit Essene characteristics, Zealot characteristics, and Messianic characteristics. And Sicari was a, a word is found in the book of Acts 2. It's the Greek word for assassin or terrorist. And uh, Josephus, who's writing in Greek, likes to call the extreme nationalist, partisan, zealot groups, Sicari, uh, assassins. But they certainly didn't call themselves this. So that's a pejorative, again, uh, being used. And so you have to say, who are the Sicari? In Josephus, the Sicari actually are the ones who commit suicide on Masada when the whole uh, revolution against Rome fell. And in the New Testament, you have this odd character, who we have recently found a gospel in his name, called Judas Iscariot. And uh, people, you just transpose the I and the S, and you get Sicarios. And uh, that's the closest thing that we have there uh, to, his, uh, to his name. So it's pretty clear to a lot of us that that's a parody of uh, Judas the Zealot, Judas the Sicari, uh, etc. And then, of course, he's portrayed in the most negative way, except in the New Gospel attributed to him, where there seems to be a somewhat reportrayal of him and so on. So um, I don't know when Christ, Christ or Christian came into play. It's very late. It's overseas. It's Greek. If it's a precise translation of something, I don't know. But in Palestine, these are the groups we have. The poor, the Ebionites, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Essene Zealots, the Zealot Essenes, the Sicari Essenes, and so on and so forth. One last point I'd like to make on that particular uh, subject. Josephus says the Essenes participated in the war against Rome. Now, in his description of Essenes, you wouldn't get any idea because most people think of Essenes as retiring monastic sort of people. They weren't this, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were very active and not retiring, and they were uh, aggressive and not self-effacing, and so on. Uh, militant, I, I would say. So he said they didn't mind dying any kind of death. They withstood any kind of torture. In other words, they were the first martyrs, just like early Christianity says Christians were. They were the first martyrs, and uh, they wouldn't 
they would not take the name, call any man Lord, or eat any fo forbidden thing. Hippolytus says the same thing, except he's speaking about the Zealot Essenes or the Sicarii Essenes. And he says the same thing that they would withstand any torture, go to their death, any kind of thing like that. But they would not eat things sacrificed to idols rather than for forbidden things. Well, if you look at early Christian literature and you look at the book of Acts again, Acts 15, where the so-called Jerusalem Council is taking place, the final rulings by James are 